I'm joined right now by Rahul Singh. He is uh, uh, one of the most respected uh, uh, b people in the stock markets in India. He's managing partner at Ampersand Investment Advisors. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh, for taking our time for us. Uh, you know, let me start off with a broader market question right now. And I know as a long-term investor, it probably doesn't affect you. But if our viewers are watching, do you think that this is the time they can, if they've not invested, they've been watching on the sidelines, should they start investing now or should they wait and see that uh, you expect some sort of a correction to come and that would be the right time to get in? Um, hi. Uh, so I think the, uh, the risks of uh, downside are uh, very much there. Uh, I think if someone who's not invested uh, can put in, you know, 25% of the money which he wants to invest in at this point of time, uh, at the current levels in the markets, and especially given the mid caps, the way they are still holding on, uh, and then wait for uh, a slightly more time correct, slightly longer time correction, or probably a deeper correction. Our view is that we will probably get a longer time correction rather than a deeper uh, price correction. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, I think uh, for a new investors, uh, for new investors, it makes sense to probably deploy, um, you know, one fourth of what they want, want to deploy at the end of, uh, you know, end of this uh, corrective phase or end of the corrective phase, you say. So, uh, it, we have seen some time consolidation, uh, time correction, consolidation taking place for uh, almost two months or more. Yeah, so I think uh, what I meant was that, uh, you know, this corrective phase will probably last uh, more. Uh, some more time because the if you look at the uh, results and the what the companies are saying most of the companies even in the consumer discretionary side uh, in their uh, results commentary have said that they they expect the second half to be better and when they say second half november december becomes extremely critical for some of those uh, macro data points and recovery to start showing through, whether it's because of monsoons or pay commission or lower rates. So we have had a nice uh, uh, turn in the macro uh, tidings uh, based on these three factors, but that has not really resulted in yet in uh, uh, exact pickup in the numbers in terms of the consumer demand or in terms of the investment demand. Most of it is ahead of us. Right. Now, when we say most of it is ahead of us, are there risks to it? I think there are risks that the expectation which is there, especially in mid-caps, given the valuations where, where they are sitting on, the, uh, the expectations of uh, a, a slight disappointment is always there. And that slight disappointment could turn into either a longer time correction or, um, or a deep price correction. Um, so we have seen that in this result season, for example, so far, that good results have been treated with enthusiasm but not so much enthusiasm whereas the bad results obviously have got punished so th so you know obviously the market is uh, running out of steam a little bit and it's showing up in the last two months it could continue to show up for the next couple of months as well in terms of uh, in terms of the markets themselves people who are investing trading on a regular basis circulating their money from one part to the other how important right now is it for them to look at global liquidity? Are they looking at earnings alone right now in India or are they continuing to look at global liquidity? So we have to uh, have an eye on the global liquidity. But, you know, I'll step back a little bit and uh, talk about mid-caps here especially because uh, a large part of the mid-cap, small-cap, micro-cap rally has not really been driven by uh, global liquidity. Uh, obviously, the global liquidity is helping the large caps, the index stocks, uh, and so on. But the mid-cap and the small-cap rally has been driven completely by the domestic uh, money flows, whether it's in the mutual funds, the mid-cap funds, or in PMSs, and so on. Uh, so therefore, that leg uh, of liquidity is still very strong. I don't see it uh, uh, going back or kind of turning back uh, because if you look at the other investment options, you know, the rates are coming down. Uh, gold is no longer a, uh, uh, an investment which people now look at. Real estate is, is obviously not going anywhere. Uh, 
so equity is, uh, is in a sweet spot in that sense from a domestic uh, flow perspective. Um, but obviously, you know, it, it cannot continue endlessly. There will be uh, there will be sanity checks uh, in between whenever valuation gets ahead of fundamentals. And we are at a point where uh, it, it seems like that the risks to downside are slightly more than the risks to the upside, uh, given that the valuations have gone up and, and the data has still not come in. So when I look at Ampersand Investment Advisors, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of people, what kind of level of investors do you advise, do you work with? So we are basically uh, a SEBI registered investment advisor and we are advising uh, uh, family offices and uh, high net worth individuals on their, on their equity portfolios, direct equity portfolios. So uh, does that have a minimum uh, SEBI defined minimum amount there? Is it 25 lakhs that someone has to have to be able to get your advice? No, actually the investment advisory um, rule or the license is uh, pretty flexible on that. Uh, so we have an investment advisory license and not a PMS license. So we are advisors. We don't uh, invest on their behalf, uh, and 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 we get fees and uh, for for our advice. So there is no minimum criteria which is which SEBI prescribes. But by the very definition, uh, uh, you know, since we are advising uh, HNIs and family offices, our uh, investors or our clients tend to be uh, uh, to be larger investors uh, than the amount you mentioned. So, d does it become more a capital protection thing when you advise them? With people with a lot of money, and they're not really looking only to increase their wealth. They also need to protect the capital that they have. So, does that change the nature of advice that you would give to a person, let's say, who has just uh, one lakh rupees to invest versus the kind of HNI or family office? No, not really. I mean, uh, the direct equity portfolio for most of these family offices is only part of their wealth. So it is not that 100% of their wealth is, is in equity, so we need to have a capital protection strategy in place. Mm. Uh, so they obviously allocate a certain part of their uh, total wealth into direct equities. Mm. And, and to that extent, uh, we, have an, we have a pure pro, you know, growth approach. We mm. don't have a value approach per se. Mm. And we, uh, our investment philosophy is to identify ideas and sectors where, uh, you know, where, where growth is going to be likely surprising uh, the market expectations. And which is where, you know, if you look at our themes which we have played on over the last uh, 9 to 12 months, mm. we started with specialty chemicals, moved on to cement and NBFCs. Mm. We still like cement. Uh, <laughs> now we also think the construction space uh, is leading to some very interesting opportunities in the uh, in the construction equipment space. Okay. Uh, so, so we are now focusing on that segment uh, where I think the valuations have still not run up and, and there are opportunities for a pickup in demand. Do your disclosure norms allow you to talk about specific stocks, Mr. Singh? Uh, yes, with the dis with the uh, uh, disclosure that you know uh, most of the stocks which we talk about would you know our clients would have interest in in those stocks. Okay, then let me start off with that last point that you made about construction and construction equ equipment. I've been asking this question to many people, and most people have not really uh, focused too much on this. Um, and I'm really keen to get your views and pick your brains on that. If you could just give us. What are the ideas there? What kind of stocks are you looking at? So if you look at the uh, public uh, spending capex, I mean the private capex is not picking up. Everyone knows that. It could take 6 to 12 months. But the public capex uh, or the infra spending from the government and government agencies is in full swing and uh, we have seen the order books uh, swelling in the ENC companies. All the ENC companies almost which we have looked at are sitting on order book to sales ratio which are at a 3 to 4 year high. Um, that means that the execution of these orders are, are beginning to start now. We will see 
uh, the numbers, the top line of these EMC companies going up in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. But if you look at the, what kind of demand it is generating for equipments, which is basically uh, all the kind of construction equipment which goes into say roads or railways uh, and movement of, uh, movement of goods in general, uh, there, is, there, is, uh, there is a demand which is, uh, for example, the construction equipment uh, segment as a whole grew 49% in April to uh, August this year mm. as per the industry data. Mm. So what it is resulting in is to, uh, to lead to a demand increase for the companies which are suppliers to these construction equipment. So we are talking about companies like Kirloskar Oil Engines, Cummins, who supply engines to uh, to to the uh, to the industries which supply construction equipment, mm. and these are sectors and stocks which are uh, good quality managements, uh, very capable companies, but obviously not not in focus over the last uh, mm. you know two or three years. Mm. So we think there is an opportunity there uh, for for a sustained two to three year kind of uh, a demand increase. Um, we could take it could take another three months, six months for it to start showing up in numbers in some cases, but uh, but I think uh, there is there is an opportunity here in this space uh, to uh, to capitalize on this capital uh, capex boom which is uh, ahead of us, especially in the public uh, spending side. So you're actually choosing the suppliers rather than the construction companies themselves. At this stage, yes, because suppliers, uh, the ENC companies still have a lot of balance sheet issues. I know some of them are getting resolved with the new, with the new cabinet decision on uh, releasing some payments which are under arbitration and so on. But uh, there are still issues there. Uh, we will obviously look at those sectors more closely, maybe three to six months uh, down the line. Um, but uh, there are good quality companies available there as well. So, for example, one of the companies which we like in the road construction space is KNR. Um, you know, it is sitting on uh, order book to sales ratio of five times. Uh, balance sheet is uh, pretty stable and clean. Uh, we think the execution is going to surprise on the upside in in KNR uh, compared to what the market is expecting. So, um, so that's one name which, which really stands out among the names which we have looked in the ENC space. There are a few others like uh, PNC, uh, then Ashoka, Biltcon. Have you looked at them and do you find them worth buying or you think that they're kind of expensive at the moment? No, I think uh, what we have to look at, you know, you, you obviously can look at a basket of these, but uh, if I were to pick one name, that will be KNR. Uh, what also happens in, especially in road construction space and a lot of these ENC space uh, is that the mid-size players tend to focus on geographies, on certain geographies. So KNR is mostly south-based, PNC is mostly north-based, both very similar, uh, but, uh, you know, very little to differentiate uh, them. But uh, what I would like to tell investors is basically that, you know, you have to focus on one company in that segment and the best company in that segment and go ahead with it, uh, which, is why, uh, which is why we focus on KNR more than others. All right. uh, before I move on to some other sectors, just to uh, and need a clarification. When you say that your investment philosophy is actually more on growth and you don't do value-based uh, valuation, analysis or whatever, even if you do, it's not a value-driven model. Is there also an element of momentum here? Do you, is it a long-term growth that you're looking at or do you play the momentum and then get out? No, I think it's growth relative to expectations. I mean, it's very important to uh, identify growth uh, ahead of uh, others. And when I say others, it has to look at, uh, it has to be at reasonable valuations. So some of the names which I mentioned, uh, for example, Cement or NBFC, we were, we were slightly ahead of uh, the curve in terms of the, uh, in terms of identifying these uh, opportunities. Similarly, in the construction and construction uh, equipment space, uh, I think it's still largely an unloved uh, sector and it's an out of sight, out of mind sector. So, uh, so we would we would obviously look at uh, sectors which are not, in fact, contrary to what you said, we would like to look at sectors and stocks 
which are not really momentum plays. Uh, it's, it works the other way around uh, because because what we are trying to identify is growth at uh, reasonable valuations and not at and not at any valuation. So, uh, let me rephrase that question. Actually, what I meant is that. Uh, once it's done its run, do you get out or do you hold on to these companies? The again, as you said, they're out of mind. But once the market starts looking at them and they move into that momentum space, people start buying, funds start covering, do you get out? And that specifically question would apply to NBFCs, for instance. Yeah, I mean, that depends really on how soon and uh, how unjustified the valuation becomes. It's very difficult to answer that question in, with a blanket uh, yes or no. Uh, because in some cases, we have remained invested. In most of the cases, we, we have remained invested. For example, in cement, we remain invested. Uh, and we have even added uh, some to, 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 you know, we've even asked our clients to add positions uh, you mean on the on ones existing. that you are invested in, in the cement space? Um, NBFCs. So I think uh, our clients. I mean, we we basically advising still come still the investors to be uh, our clients to be invested in uh, Shri Cement Dalmia and one of the north based producers, which is JK Lakshmi. So these are the three stocks we prefer, and we are uh, still advising uh, to remain invested in in, in the cement sector. Um, so NBFCs is a slightly different uh, ball game because there the valuations run up has been very very sharp uh, and in some cases unjustified. So we are mostly uh, mostly in housing finance companies at this point uh, of time for our clients, not really in the uh, other other segments of uh, the uh, of the NBFC space. Which ones have you taken? Uh, have you advised your clients to take profit off the table from, and which ones are you advising them to stay on in? Well, I think the um, uh, the uh, the normal finance companies, whether it was you know ABNL or whether it was um, the gold finance companies, I think the valuation run up is now uh, is now is now quite up to the um, up to the level where most of the positives are priced in. So we have advised our clients to take money off the table there. And the ones that you are still telling them to get into or uh, hold on to. That's only the housing finance company that I mentioned uh, because if you look at the rate declines uh, which have happened and which are ahead of us, for housing finance companies there is an opportunity to uh, still improve their names uh, going forward over the next uh, you know, two to three quarters uh, and the valuation in some cases is still uh, reasonable. So uh, we uh, particularly like uh, LIC housing finance where, uh, where we think the valuation relative to the uh, ROE profile and the business profile is still reasonable, so there could be some amount of re-rating which uh, which is, which can happen in LIC housing finance. Okay, and, uh, you know, there's another out of mind sector. At least it comes up once in a while, and then people take money off the table, and that's real estate. Uh, do you think that it is something that people can start buying, or or is it still far away from any recovery? Well, it's interesting because the pace of new launches have come down across all the cities and the absorption rates are uh, have not come down as much, so they are still holding on. So we are getting to a point where this sector could become uh, interesting. But uh, to be very frank, uh, there is it's going to be a regional approach, so we'll have to look at market by market and look at uh, markets which are probably where the absorption rates are much higher like uh, like in the south uh, as compared to say NCR where the absorption rates are still very very uh, slow so um, so i think it's it's uh, it's it's coming to a point where it the sector could become interesting but uh, but the uh, you know but but it could still be a long wait even if you get in now it could still be a long wait before uh, the inventory starts to get cleared off so you know we would rather stay on the sidelines for some more time um, for maybe a quarter or two before we can we can take a firm view on the sector
one final question is there any specific sector that you're now studying looking at you've not had any specific choices but you've just started looking at it well uh, we've had a look at uh, banks uh, a number of times in the last one one and a half years without any conclusion so we have we have asked we have you know all our investors to stay out of that sector for the last 12 to 18 months so that's one sector which uh, you know which obviously pops up uh, on every valuation screen especially psu banks um so so i think the uh, so i think the, uh, the you know whether you call it opportunity or valuation uh, or a mix thereof uh, there there could be an opportunity like real estate in the next uh, one or two quarters to to have a look at that sector and make make some bets on that sector but not not again again it's at a point of time where the conviction levels are still not as high as they should be for um, for sectors like that to be picked up in the portfolio all right uh, rahul singh thank you so much for taking us time out time for us and uh, i wish you a happy diwali thanks a lot